Being a podcaster is a very privileged thing to do. And my guest today, Mark Taylor, has been a podcaster for five years. And in this conversation, he shares what he's learned from talking with people over those five years that all have one thing in common, and that is how to improve educational experiences and outcomes for children. And in this fascinating conversation, Mark shares one really powerful and profoundly simple exercise that can transform relationships either with your pupils or across a whole staff. So I'd urge you to listen to that. And he also shares a very personal story of when his own daughter attempted to take her life and was on suicide watch for a long time. And what he learned from that, what she learned, what the family learned from that, and ultimately what happened as a result. Please enjoy this wide ranging conversation. Welcome to the Pursuit of Wellbeing podcast. My name's Maria Brosnan. I'm the founder of Pursuit and your host for the show. This podcast is dedicated to providing wellbeing information, inspiration, and support for teachers leaders and school staff around the world. My guest today is Mark Taylor. Mark is the host and founder of the Education on Fire podcast. He interviews educators from around the world to enable his listeners to support your children to live, learn and grow to their full potential. Mark is vice chair for the National Association for Primary Education, a non-political education charity. And Mark has been a professional percussionist for 25 years and has had the opportunity of performing with some of the UK's finest orchestras and theatre companies. Finding his passion and voice through music gave Mark the desire to share his understanding through his drama and percussion teaching, which he provides in schools and in his private practice. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Maria, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's been a, I'm really excited about the conversation that we have. Yeah, well, it's... I'm going to pause here. Oh, yeah, I thought for a moment that I'd left out that you were the host of Education. Right. So I'll I'll just say, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Maria, thank you so much. I'm really excited about our conversation and thank you so much for inviting me on. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's great to speak with a fellow podcaster. It absolutely is. Yes, it's uh, it's an environment which I've loved that as long as I've been involved, it's such a friendly and supportive community. And it's, yeah, I just absolutely love being involved. So, yeah, podcaster to podcaster. (laughs) <laughs> well, you've been doing it for a while now, almost five years, you said about right? That's right. Yeah. December 2016 is when I when I first launched and it's been, mm-hmm. yeah, it's been an interesting journey since then through various seasons and, and well-being being um, one that I focused on um, for quite a few weeks. And yes, and now it's a little bit more general, but basically, as you said in your introduction, if, if it's something which I believe can support the children in your life or something that you can do to pass that on to make their, their learning experience exciting and more more authentic then then that's a very positive thing that I like to share with people yeah for sure and I guess a good starting point then would be what have you learned from from your podcast that that you could share with our listeners that like it's a super easy takeaway something that they could do practically today or tomorrow that could improve their well-being I think the biggest thing that I've learned from so many people that have responded to my question about what's the greatest advice you would give them or or what would you sort of pass on to your younger self is it's often it's actually about that human interaction. It's about the conversations you have with uh, your colleagues. It's about the conversations that you have with the, the pupils if you're if you're in a school. And it's about that kind of being seen, I think, is the most important thing. And I think at the heart of everything, we are human beings. We're, we're people who want to interact and we want to share our, our common commonality, our goals, our, our life. And I think that's the biggest thing is that every time I might get stressed or I'm not quite sure what I'm doing or I'm in a class where it's all about the stuff in inverted commas in terms of what I'm trying to teach, just remembering that actually I'm teaching this person or this conversation is about me and it's about you and as soon as I feel like that's the most important thing everything else kind of starts to dissolve and just allows me to to sort of sink back into the you know we're in a life together that we're sharing it's not necessarily about giving knowledge or or sharing something I have to make sure that you understand. Uh, I think that's beautiful and I think connection is one of the real pillars of of our well-being and I think um, especially this year that's been it's been difficult for us because as you say we're humans and we're we're hardwired to be connected and 
taking that moment to just tune in to the person that you're with, whether that's, you know, over over Zoom like we are now or face-to-face with a, a partner, a family member, student, colleague. Um, yeah, it's a lovely, a lovely starting point. And so tell us, what do you believe a person's well-being is made up of, just from your observation, your experience? I think there there are there are two sides to the coin really. There's who you believe you are. Um you can call it spiritually or or really just kind of the essence of, of the, the person that we are when everything else disappears and we're sort of on our own, just sort of with our own self, as it were. And then there's the environment that we're in, you know. And I kind of think of both sides of that a little bit like Nelson Mandela, you know, somebody who was in, in prison for such a long time but yet came out of prison having been in that environment, but still this most amazing human being and sort of forgave his captors, sort of understood the situation, was able able to come out into the world and do such amazing things in South Africa. So there's that kind of element there. And I sort of think in a school sometimes it can be very difficult, you know, with curriculums and and pressures and time pressures and and all the things that uh, you sort of deem that you have to do. That's very easy to get into that cycle of everything that you're doing. And, And like I said, that kind of understanding of who am I in all of this and sort of Nelson Mandela's example it's that kind of he knew who he was he understood that he had a relationship with himself and and the human element of that despite the the, the situation he was in and I think that's the same for all of us in education as well despite the the tick boxing maybe we have to do or the certain way a school looks now we can actually bring ourselves into that and actually understanding that this is who I am and how I want to show up in the world, no matter what that environment happens to be. And at the same time, understanding that it might be difficult because, you know, I'm in a school which is very difficult for whatever reason or, you know, I'm, I'm in jail. That's going to be a difficult situation. But either side, understanding that the two things go hand in hand and how your perception of that is 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 going to make a difference to your overall well-being. So you could be in a difficult position but still be aware of of who you are and therefore be grounded in some way or, or spiritually aware that you're that person in that environment um and and sometimes actually being in a difficult environment makes that easier because you have to kind of go there to kind of really understand it when everything in sort of the the earth world as it were is very it's very rosy and everything's going really well you kind of get sort of sort of engrossed in that and it all seems to sort of take care of itself but then sometimes you don't need to have that kind of aspect of yourself as well so I think a combination of those two things can be really really important yeah and and I, I like the idea of challenging our own beliefs from time to time and especially the ones that are limiting where we where we might see ourselves as less than we possibly could be Did, does that make sense to you or how how would you suggest people challenge their limiting beliefs so they can operate more fully in the environment as you so beautifully described it I I think for me it's understanding that you can either feel like you're striving to create the world that you want whether that's your home life your work life or or the 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 universal world that we're living in or that you're allowing it to unfold and Mm. I think when you're connected with yourself and you're feeling like actually I know I'm in this situation whether it's good bad or indifferent but I'm actually aware of that enough to allow a belief that you know I always think back to you know when you sort of see a toddler running around they're not bothered about anything other than the fact that they're alive and they want to run and jump and yeah. play and and all of that and and I know we get older and you know there's a transition from there through childhood into adulthood but I think there's an element of in us all that that's who we are and I think the more we can just allow ourselves to to do each day to be able to know that life will work for us rather than against us then that it's amazing when you sort of allow that to happen the more it does happen um and that's very difficult because it's like you say it's it's releasing a whole load of limiting beliefs and why do those beliefs come usually because we've thought that way and it compounds what it is that we we think we do you know we think this day is going to be hard or this lesson's going to be hard or my relationship with this person is going to be hard and so you get into that cycle whereas when you sort of allow yourself to think okay 
I know who I am and I know that if I can just take a deep breath, understand all the different relationships I have and all the different circumstances I have and how I can adapt to each of those, you know, I'm not going to talk to this person the same as that person because I understand their personalities and where they're coming from. I know all of these things will flourish because essentially that's what we want to do. And it may well be, of course, that, you know, you want to get out of a different, a difficult situation or a difficult relationship because that's what you need to do for your well-being. It's not that everything can work for the greater good, but I think there is that kind of, I need to make a decision sometimes. But I think generally, and a lot of the time, you're, the way you are with yourself and allowing that to unfold can really change the rest of the world around you. Yeah, and... I love that. It's, it's, I've been reading a lot about this lately, and it's a subject that fascinates me, how to be present, you know, how can you just I, – I love the way you said that no matter if it's good or bad or indifferent, whatever the situation is, you just bring yourself to that situation and allow it to be. Uh, things unfold with a lot less hassle, I have grown to discover. <laughs> I think also is the fact that it puts a lot of pressure on you. And I think that's where a lot of um, stress and anxiety comes from is the fact that, you know, if I'm living in this house with this lovely garden and the sun shining and I've got all my loved ones around me the majority of the time, then my life is going to be wonderful. Um, mm. And the chances are in that scenario, it probably would be. But that isn't to say that if you're in a difficult situation, maybe there's someone around you that's poorly or, you know, I don't know, maybe you've lost your job or, or your your situation as a teacher is really tricky. Maybe you've got a difficult, difficult relationship going on. That doesn't mean to say that your life will only be fantastic when that gets resolved. It's like you have to be present literally in that particular moment. And, and, and it's different there. It might be that, you know, out of, I don't know, 60% of your day, you might have found very stressful. But the 40% where you had that wonderful conversation with somebody or a child came to you and said, oh, this really made all the difference, which really kind of lights you up inside because yeah, that's what it's all about. That's why I'm here. That's what I'm trying to do. You sort of, you know, the, the they, we talk about sort of balance, but I think a lot of the time it's harmony. It's the fact that there are some times when everything is wonderful. There are some times when you're going through a season which can be very difficult, but the harmony of all of that, and you take from each element what it is that supports you at the time. It might be a short walk. It might be literally a deep breath when you're in a stressful situation. It might be that everything's wonderful and actually you don't need to think quite so deeply about that, but there are times that you will be. And I think understanding that you have the tools and the intuition sometimes if you give yourself enough chance to to think about it and I've, i think that's where the techniques like mindfulness and yoga um and and also the practical things i mean it's why i love being a musician it's the fact that that kind of presence and that, and that letting go and release that you talked about i found the most when i was being a musician because you do hours and hours and hours of practice and the better you become for me anyway a lot of the time the more stressful the situation became and the the more you start thinking about that and the more high profile it became and, and the harder the situation that you perceive it to be the less likely you are to be a musician because what happens is is that you want to be a, a point where you can let go of all of that be engrossed in the music collaboratively with all the people that you're working with and it's that almost um a musical harmony not in a in a kind of a, a a note context but a kind of a an emotional context that makes something really amazing happen you know the the, the hairs on the back of your your neck stand up or, or you kind of just feel like you've been spoken to in a way that you can't be in any other way and that can only happen when all those hours of practice and all the other stuff that you've done just you realize it's just a tool that enables you to show up in a way that makes a big difference. And I think the thing about being a musician was the fact that I was able to see, hear and understand that very directly from, from that very specific situation. And um, it's a little bit like when you sort of hear tennis players saying, Oh, it's, you know, the tennis ball looked like it was the size of a football. I couldn't miss. It was just coming at me. You know, they're just at one with everything. And it's, and, and even then they can't replicate it every single time they play. They obviously they have a standard they work to all the time, but you just know sometimes when everything is just working and you just have to embrace it and love it. And I think that's as close to a, you know the the connection to life as you can you can possibly get and 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 then then it's just a reflection and an experience of what it is to experience that here in this sort of earthly world if you want to put it in that way mm. and they're definitely skills i i love the metaphor i'm a musician myself and have done 
many gigs all over the world. And I love that um, understanding that they get harder, right? As the stakes get higher, it gets harder until they're not anymore, until you know that you can walk onto any stage and perform to a standard because you've put in the hours and you've had the practice. And like anything that you practice, teaching or leading or being a parent, you just naturally, the more you apply your skill, yourself, the, the better the skill level. You know, you just get better at it. And and being present is most definitely one of those skills that you can improve with super simple techniques. And and the quality of your life will definitely improve as a result. It, it definitely will. And, and I think you're right about I, – I love the, the correlation between – sort of the the performance element as a musician but also as a teacher or someone you know essentially when you're in a classroom and when you're teaching you're performing to an extent and hopefully as authentically as you can but it's a shared experience at its best I think um and a little bit uh, like I said at the very beginning about that human connection I remember I was working once with the English National Ballet and I was at the London Coliseum at Christmas um and we were doing Nutcracker and it's it's like the most magical thing in the entire world. Um, and for some reason I was, I was really felt quite under the cosh about it. I think it was because I'd not played with them for a little while. I hadn't done any rehearsals because I'd done it many times before, but I hadn't been in that particular season to do it and sat there just thinking, you know, I can breathe and I've, I've got all the tools to help me do the best that I possibly can. And then just above the rail, um, in the front row, this little girl just stood over and started looking down and she's all dressed up in her finery, looking down, looking at the orchestra, knowing that she you knows she's about to see all this ballet going on on stage. And I thought, yeah, that's why we're here to make that most amazing special moment for that particular little girl to enjoy what she's going to do. And then whether I'm using my right hand, my left hand, whether I'm doing anything doesn't really make any difference. You know, I'm here to give her an experience that's going to be wonderful and hopefully, you know, life-changing in some ways, should it be something which she obviously really enjoys and she gets an experience from. And I think that's exactly the same when you're in a classroom, certainly when I'm teaching percussion, if you can speak to someone that they, they finally get something or they understand something, or you just have that might even just be a, a kind of an acknowledgement of, almost like eye contact of I can see where you are today and I've got you don't worry it's okay um and I think that just reframes everything that you're doing and for me the more of those moments I can create on a regular basis the more it connects to me and the more everything seems to develop and be positive and my well-being generally just improves because it's not about an outcome it's not about how I think it should be it's about knowing that I've made a difference in someone else's life but that obviously has a massive impact on your own life as well yeah. And I remember reading a while back that, that Google did some research to find out what helped people feel um, part of a team, you know, that, that was working well together. So what made a successful team? And they did research for two years, I think it was, and they tried to put people together that were friends or that were not friends or that had a similar academic or educational background or that didn't, you know, and they tried every combination and they couldn't figure out what it was that that uh, made a good high-performing team. And then finally they cracked it and it was psychological safety and it was exactly as you described, you know, the smile, the acknowledgement, the whatever it takes to help people feel safe in your presence and that could be a colleague or a pupil but um it's especially now so important to just create that environment with the people around you that they're safe with you. It, it, it really does. It was interesting, a little story here. My, um, our youngest is now um, just in secondary school and um, and I, I live in Northamptonshire and, um, and they very recently had a knife amnesty and and i'd heard on the on the radio that this was going on um and i thought okay you know i know this happens every now and again and it's really important you know knife crimes are a, a large thing that needs to be helped and supported in whichever way and and this is a way that obviously the police were going about it anyway my, my daughter comes home and says you'll never guess what we turned up at school and everybody please was there and we had to walk through metal detectors and they they brought the knife amnesty into the school um mm-hmm. And 
she goes to a lovely school so i'm, I'm i'd be very surprised if they found one but who knows when I mean, you, you never know what's going on sort of inside of of organizations but the thing that struck me the most was the fact that having had children out of school for such a long time to to have that at that particular moment i thought I wonder where the joined up thinking is there. And I think that's important sometimes in our organizations is the fact that the children were coming back to school. Some are fearful about the fact that the, you know, the virus is still around and, and, and what does that mean for me? Um, and they're being tested all the time. Um, they're with lots of different people. Um, and but coming back to school, gradually getting into the norm, seeing their friends, kind of feeling that kind of relaxation into, ah, oh, right, I'm in this community that I'm fully aware of. I did wonder a little bit about the fact that then having what is perceived to then be a fearful situation because I'm now having to go through a metal detector. That's not something I normally do. You know, are there knives around me all the time? Is there something that's going on? I thought it's interesting, you know, where in terms of how we create an, an atmosphere within our organization, I'm sure the school didn't have any any choice about whether it was going to happen on that day or happen at all. But in, in terms of that sort of global thinking sometimes about, you know, what's the atmosphere that we're creating and what do we want to do? And how does every element of that, from the moment you walk into a school, from the moment you walk into your classroom, from the things that you even... I think what I'm, I'm really getting at is the fact there are certain things that you have to do, but sometimes how you frame it and how you put it in into into reality can can have a big difference. And I guess if they told them that it was going to happen, then it wouldn't have the same effect. But then by the token of of that kind of suddenly turning up at the school gates and having and there was you no, know, I think there was a real fear factor for lots of people. Um, I I think that there's a little bit of thought in there that can be can be sort of related to that kind of how you set up an environment overall especially if you have that choice. Yeah. And what other ways do you think that the atmosphere of school can be transformed? Do you have any kind of practical ideas on on that? I think certainly the essence of having a broad curriculum in whichever way you can, and I know that depends on the age of the children and the situation, but I think having a breadth um, of things which you can do really make a big difference. So, as a musician, being able to have music in my life basically allowed me to, like I said, to have a voice and to show up in, in a particular way. I know that's certainly the same for for people who are really into sport, um, the humanities and drama to be able to express yourself, as well as the people who who do that through some of the STEM subjects, all of which are very, very important. But I think finding a way where there's almost an equal playing field through all of these things and I, I as we as we said before there, there's curriculum and, and there's standards you have to meet and all of that kind of thing but i think those schools and those teachers that are really brave and fearless and actually have a child-centered idea of what they're trying to create as an environment i think when that's the case and that people have a chance to think this is where i'm showing up in my school whether that's the chance to be in a play, whether it's a chance to be on a debate team or, or whatever it happens to be, it means that you feel like you belong. And you also get to learn that some things you're great at, some things you're okay at, some things maybe you're not so good at, but that doesn't matter because we know there's somewhere that we fit in. And I think the narrower the curriculum comes in, the harder that is for those people who don't fit into that kind of sort of narrow area. So I think understanding that everyone needs to have a voice and a way to express themselves. And and I think the irony of this is the fact that when you have schools where that is the case, the standards are usually really good because everyone feels better. The well-being of the children is better. The the staff often feel like they're able to express themselves better as well. And so everybody seems to produce their best version of themselves in other subjects as well. And and I think if I if I could advise anyone to do anything, just don't be scared to kind of do what you know needs to be done. And if that's slightly adding an extra subject or an after school club, if you can't have it during the school day or a way that children can express themselves outside of what it is that would normally be perceived as the norm, I think that's really positive. And you mentioned a simple exercise in understanding what's happening in the lives of others around them. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Mark? Yeah, so that was a really interesting conversation I had on my show. Um, and it was with uh, a lady called Tina Owen Moore, and she'd written a book um, called The Alliance Way, and it was about a bully f- bully-free school is basically what they've managed to create over in America. But I think the exercise is true for pupils, but also for, for teachers and as well. 
And what they did was, was that they found that as soon as you had empathy and you had an understanding of what other people are going through in life on any given moment, your reason for wanting to be a bully or to be a certain way with everyone around you is very different. And so their simple exercise was that everybody anonymously wrote down something that was going on in their life. And they literally then put it into a hat and then there was the ability then for it to be read out. So no one knew who it was, no one knew what was going on other than I can tell you having read this piece of paper that actually, actually my father beats me up when I'm at home was uh, as an example um, mm. uh, of one of these situations or, you know, my, my mother's very poorly and going through chemotherapy or um, actually I don't have enough to eat at home. So therefore I come to school hungry. And so you don't know what, who, who that child is or who that teacher is. Or, and I think from, from an adult perspective, it may well be, you know, I'm caring for a, a parent who's maybe got dementia and it's taking a lot of time out of my way. It may well be that my, you know, my spouse has lost their job and therefore the financial burden on me is really starting to mount up. Or, you know, I've got a teenager that really is struggling at school and I'm, I'm struggling as a, as a teacher to teach them, but also be a parent, whatever it happens to be. Because if I know there's someone in my immediate community or my immediate surrounding who's going through that, my, thought about how I want to interact with that person is going to be very different than whatever the the ongoing kind of natural um, reaction is to somebody because maybe they're not being a certain way you know maybe and I, and I think from the bullying point of view it's that kind of let's understand why this child may be acting in a certain way the chances are there's a reason behind it so you know for a fellow teacher who's not maybe doing the sorts of work that you want to do or doesn't seem to be reacting or interacting in a way that you want them to if any of those things that I've mentioned before are going on in their life, then you're going to give them an awful lot more understanding and respect and just, it's okay, we've got you. And I think if you sort of have that perspective that you don't know what's going on in anyone's life, then you know your, your interaction then is very different. And I think that just becomes very positive because it often means that the conversation that you'll have with that person will be very different and then the conversation and the response that they give you will be very different and then that gives you a chance to grow and to maybe have a completely different relationship which will support both of you. Yeah, and I think especially at this time, Mark, where there feels like there's such polarisation on, on views on just about every subject. And, and it seems like we're losing a lot of the subtlety and a lot of the nuance in the discussion, especially when you look on social media. It's black or white. It's good. It's bad. It's right. It's wrong. And I think the more that we can bring our understanding and that exercise sounds beautiful, just to think what could be a reason why somebody has made the decision that they have made or that they're choosing to live their life in the way that they are. Just taking that moment to build that little bridge of understanding could transform relationships. And doing it anonymously is super interesting in the classroom or in a staff room, just to say, what is everybody going through right right now? And imagine just that surge of empathy and care that we'd feel for each other. I think I think what you said there's really important about the the whole energy around it because there's something amazing about the collectiveness of it when it's anonymous. Like you say, if it's an entire staff room that's done it, that's very mm-hmm. different than knowing that you know Mrs. Brown is going yeah. through this particular situation. You know, it's whereas I, I just think yeah, there's something about you know, we're all going through something and it might be a wonderful thing. It might be something which is hard, but we're all going through something. So therefore that again, it's back to that kind of human understanding and that human connection. And I think wellness in in its essence is, is essentially that, you know, it's finding a way back to where that connection comes with ourselves and, and what we're doing. And, and like I said, whether you've got things like NLP that help you or whether it's mindfulness or, or whatever the tools are that you use, they're all fantastic in terms of whatever speaks to you. But the essence is, is are you reacting to your environment or are you reacting to yourself? And I think once you know those two things, then you're in good shape to to really support everybody around you. And what about the things that you have control over versus the things that you don't have control over and, and understanding how they fit together? So 
I think first of all, it's understanding that a lot of these things, especially if they if they're cyclical, are often here to maybe teach us a message or give us some kind of understanding of, of what that happens to be. Um, um, and and I think it's a little bit like you said before about the essence of kind of um, what happens when you've got no control over so for example we, we recently a couple of winters ago we had um the, um the the gas company came and redid all the mains um outside our house and they came in our boiler was old and long story short we ended up without a boiler <laughs> and for quite a long time and it was the year where there was snow and all of this sort of stuff and i very much got into this cycle of why me why now what's going on there's loads going on in our life you know it's it's just really really difficult to doing that and I got really kind of you know into that cycle of someone needed to be blamed someone needed to take responsibility someone you know I didn't have a few thousand pounds to replace the boiler it was perfectly fine before the work started and now it wasn't it's like why me (laughs) um and I think the biggest message for that was the fact that it doesn't matter what's actually happened the it doesn't actually affect who you are as a person. Yes, the situation might be terrible. I couldn't control the fact that my boiler no longer worked. But what I could control was whether I wanted to get really upset, upset about it. If I wanted to keep pushing you know, the endless emails to try and get some kind of even more compensation or to blame someone or for, for someone to kind of take responsibility, which was never going to happen. And the detriment was purely down to me by the end of it you know the more i wanted to push that the harder it was going to become and it's not it's not that you have to say that the situation is okay because it might not be okay it might be that if it's to do with another person that actually even their behavior towards you is not okay in your particular um view but actually that doesn't ever affect who you are at the essence of uh, of yourself and you can then choose how important that is to kind of get the upper hand or or, or to push in one particular direction and and i think that's the thing about the bits you can control and the bits that you can't i couldn't control the fact that boiler are gone and i couldn't make anyone take a lot of responsibility for it but i could control whether i wanted to sit there and have a nice evening or i wanted to sit there and literally sort of get really worked up about it and especially i think it gets hard when these things go over a long period of time um and um and i think it's very easy then to get into that sort of cyclical idea because what happens is is that that happens and then the, the car needs fixing and then this happens and it's all about you know the whole thing starts to sort of feel like it's snowballing yeah. but i think each time you start to feel like all this is happening to me it's understanding that it's often happening for me and actually once you realize that it's probably just giving you that message of kind of how connected are you you know are you okay you know, yes, this is happening. And yes, I don't want to be in the cold winter without a boiler. Um, but actually, we got an open fire. And actually, that meant that we could be warm in one of our houses. And actually, um, in one of our rooms, sorry, not one of our houses. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just moved to a different house. No, we're, we're not in that position, unfortunately. Um, um, and yeah, we've got an electric shower. So therefore, we could, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse. And actually, just reframing it and and understanding exactly that actually the essence of where we are and what we're doing is absolutely fine and and i think that's usually the message that's usually the lesson and that's usually the place that if you find yourself there and you can gravitate back to that personal side then everything else then happens and sorts itself out you know the boiler got fixed you know this happened it all didn't become such a big deal and you think I can't believe I put myself through the 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 the, the working up that I actually did at that particular time. And interestingly, things have happened since then. Um, it's same sorts of things. Maybe it's heating related or a car related or whatever. And it's come up, and I thought, yeah, I'm not going down that. I don't need to do that. It's not happening to me for that particular reason. But interestingly, I've seen it happen to other people around me. As you see that initial reaction and that kind of cycle starting to happen, and I thought it's interesting having sort of sort of acknowledged it within yourself how you start to see those different things happen in other people and i think that's a real great gift because then you can be different with it and then that usually rubs off on the other people as well and then i think when you're in schools it's a really important thing because you can support other teachers with difficult relationships with a pupil or or a different relationship or situation within something that's happening maybe it's an Ofsted is going to come in and some people get incredibly anxious about that which I can completely understand 
But for someone who's been there and done a few of those things and they've had great ones, okay ones, maybe not so good ones, realize that the fact that that offsets on that particular day, but going back to what we said before, but we know that this other teacher's having a really terrible time at home. Does that thing really matter that much? Wouldn't you rather have a conversation with that person to give them the empathy and the support they need about their real life rather than just the result of one particular thing that's happening at school? While they're both incredibly important in different ways, I think just seeing what they are for what they are, usually that human connection is the one that's going to win through um, and, and feel, the, feel the most important to you. Yeah, and and just weaving this back in through the conversation, it's all about skill then, isn't it? And when you can let go of the annoying situation with the boiler, we had a similar situation recently with a lawyer just weirdly out of blue, like, how did that happen? Like, I, I, anyway, but the, the more quickly you can let that go and say, I accept that this situation is happening, like I, I'm not going to fight it, and you do everything you can to try and resolve it, but in the moment of staying calm in yourself and not allowing yourself to kind of spiral out into a, a terrible state, then next time it's not going to bother you so much. And, and it's definitely a skill that we can build up and it's a life skill. And ultimately we're the ones that are going to benefit hugely from that. I think that's true. And one other thing I'd just add to that is the fact that if you do spiral out of control, which I think we can all relate to, is actually, <laughs> you know, give yourself the biggest hug in the world afterwards knowing yeah i did and when you do it the next time and then you think oh i've done it again give yourself an even bigger hug because actually i think that just makes that human um understanding even more important and so yeah d don't feel like you have to fix it and do it a certain way just understand that we're which we're on this journey to try and make life easier for ourselves and yes it's great when we can let it all go but if for whatever reason it doesn't or you get triggered have, have a wry smile or take a deep breath and i don't know maybe go and do something really nice for yourself that will take you out of yourself for a few minutes <laughs> And just as we're starting to wrap up, Mark, um, I want to ask you about your role as a parent. And you mentioned before we started recording that you have a, a, a child who suffered with me mental illness while you were teaching in schools. Would you like to share that story with us? Yeah, so that was that was very that was very difficult time, and it goes back to this sense that we said before about having a season. You know, it might be that someone's ill. Our particular scenario. I mean, my, our home life is such that um there are three children in our house two are two eldest are um children from my wife's first marriage and then the youngest is 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 our our child and the eldest had was having a really difficult time and you kind of support in the best way that you can and and you think everything's going okay but it it got really serious to the point that she was hospitalized you know she she tried to take her own life more than once from a, a parent point of view it's that sense of what do you do and i think and i think this is really important from a teacher's point of view as well as you can only do what you can do for yourself which then impacts the other person you can tell someone till they're blue in the face you know don't do this do that how can i help how can i do that but everyone's on their own journey and so while you try and create a supportive environment going back to what we said before in terms of that sort of what you can control and what you can't and the, and the physicalities of all those things you know we went through a stage where you know we were on suicide watch for a long time and that's terrifying and it's exhausting and you've also got two other children that you're trying to look after you're also still trying to um to sort of earn a living as well and for me, it was just that sense of I had some fantastic support um, from someone. I was involved in a hospice, um, part of the chaplaincy team, not in a religious bent necessarily, but in that kind of spiritual aspect of kind of supporting people. So I, I sort of was aware of, of what was needed, but the support I got there was fantastic. And it really became very, very clear that you have to look after yourself first. Because if you don't look after yourself first, you're not any good to anybody else. So whatever it takes to give you the space you need on any given moment, to to get the rest that you need, to give yourself the understanding that you need, especially when you're going through something which is very difficult, gives you the energy that you need to then support the other people in your life. So for me, it was then, you know, my my wife and the, and the children, you know, in terms of what we needed to do just to get through every single day. And and I think the, the most important thing with that was the fact that it was never our decision about how that was going to work out. It was always down to 
our elders to decide actually i want my life to look different and there, there's a there's a very long conversation about how 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 she got there and and everything that was involved in that but one thing that was very interesting is we often talk about well, I said before about how it was important it was when you do um, a broad and balanced curriculum, for example. One of the biggest things that happened when she was in hospital was the sense of mindfulness. You know, we're going to do some colouring. We're going to just do something which you want to do, play table tennis. We're going to have conversations which make a big difference just to the here and now. And while at the same time, amazingly, you still have to go to school even when you're <laughs> when you're in that situation for a couple of hours a day or something, the rest, it just becomes pointless, you know. I mean, what's you know? We're talking about someone who's making a decision on a regular basis about how they want to, their life to look, but actually how if they want their life to continue at all. But there's a definite moment when you suddenly felt the difference being you need to choose what it is that you want. Do you want to survive? Do you want to thrive, or do you not? And there's a de- there was a definite moment when that changed. And it wasn't something that we could do. The advice, the support, the structure was exactly the same from the beginning of the whole cycle to the end. But you definitely decided, no, I have to take responsibility here and I want it to look different. And then that was the road to recovery, you know. And we are now I'm probably three years on from where where that was originally and she also had to go through the whole ridiculousness of the a levels last year and all those results and the pressures with that you know very difficult for everybody but very difficult for someone who's trying to get to grips with 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 life in in a, in a new way of looking at it but she did and she did it amazingly well and she's left and she was going to go to university and could have done and thought do you know what i want to do something different i want to give back i want to do something and she's gone into the nhs and she's working in a local hospital and I just think that's just amazing. It's just amazing. And I know, interestingly, the whole thing about empathy and going full circle, she actually had a parent, a, um, a child of, um, of a patient, I think, managed to get in touch with her somewhere. And, and this patient had subsequently died, but said, I just wanted to find you and reach out to say it made all the difference. Your caring and the way you spoke to my mother about what it was just to be alive and in the hospital and what she was doing and um thought that's it that wasn't about her ability to do her job or how she went about doing the technical stuff that she had to do it was about being her and she can only do that through her journey she can only do it through what she wanted to do and it just made all the difference i mean and she's just the most delightful happy amazingly sort of positive person now still you know looking after life and understanding what's going on but you would be amazed at the transformation in such a short amount of time. And and, and just to wrap that up, um, from my experience as a teacher's point of view, was there was something that happened to me during that time. And there was a school that I was working at. And I'd done a whole load of free stuff um, in the community um, for lots of primary schools to come to a secondary school. Um, and we'd done a fantastic music day. And I'd spent hours and hours and hours on it. And this school was really struggling. And I really wanted to sort of give back in a way. And obviously music's my thing. So we organized the music day. And we'd had a really difficult week and a really difficult night and I turned up the the morning and it's about a week or two after we'd done this music day and I walked into my teaching room and the entire drum kit had been completely trashed I mean the skins had been broken the drums were all over the place so they'd also been thrown around I mean it's devastatingly bad behavior in, in, in anyone's eyes and I was really upset and of course I was exhausted and you know this whole world was going on around me and I went and found somebody and said, look, this is just really not okay. It's not acceptable. Um, it's not acceptable in anyone's behavior. But, you know, we've put all this effort in to do whatever. And I was really kind of frustrated with it. And even though the head of music at that time and the people I was working for knew exactly what I was going through, because I'd put in in or out of context the fact that I thought the school should have been in a position to hopefully not make that sort of thing happen i had to then go and apologize for the fact that i implied that it's not okay that it was i shouldn't have implied that it wasn't okay for this drum kit to have been trashed and i thought one how anyone could have made me go and do that because i you know in my eyes (laughs) it shouldn't have been trashed it's that's not okay the behavior is not okay and um but i thought all those people around me who knew directly what i was going through couldn't just say it's okay we'll just have a quiet word you know because even if i had overstepped the mark which i don't think i ever did you know to have a conversation and just say look 
we know what's happening at this moment. Can we not have a little bit of empathy? Do you really need him to come and talk to somebody and say these words just so that they can tick a box? And um, and so I think that's kind of a combination of all those things that we've actually spoken about, you know, understanding what people are going through, having a little bit of support and understanding for the environments that are happening and the experiences that people are going through. But then also at the same time, that kind of human element of kind of actually I did what I did at the time because I <laughs> it felt like it was the right thing for me to say. And I still believe it was the right thing for me to say um, because I don't want the world to look like that. You know, I want the world to look different. And it just seems like... Like, you know, for me, it was that sense of this drum room is somebody's um, saving grace. You know, it's their sanctuary somewhere that they can go in. You know, the young me was the person who found their voice in a, in a drum room. And actually, whoever it was that had done the, all the damage has stopped that person from doing it. And as a school, I'd rather that wasn't the case, you know. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's kind of the, the key of just understanding on how all those things go in. I probably would have maybe framed it differently had I been, you know, like we said, my life was such that it was sunny all the time and the garden was lovely and everything was happening. It was easy at home. Maybe I would have, I would have been in a different frame of mind, but I was where I was. But I think understanding those two things together was just important and, a, and an interesting experience for me, certainly. Yeah. And, and the phrase that really stood out there for me, Mark, was that life is happening for you. And not to you and how to pull that from this whole it feels like the theme of our conversation doesn't it how to allow life to happen for you yeah i think that's uh, in a nutshell that's it and uh yeah and and uh, that's that really doesn't come for me that comes from like i say a whole host of people that if i had to sort of put those things into one phrase i think i think that's it that that's a phrase which kind of comes through and, and can make the biggest difference it's in your life because once you've got that as a concept you can then take that deep breath and allow it to to disperse in in a way that's going to help you mark thank you so much for your time today it's been a joy speaking with you thank you maria it's been really wonderful conversation and um i hope that people listening can really identify with a couple of those things and if, if you can make that smile to that one person and make that eye contact and know that you're on the same world and on the same wavelength then i think the world's going to be a much greater place for everybody very good Thank you, Mark. I've been speaking with Mark Taylor. You can connect with Mark on Twitter at Taylor Maps. That's T-A-Y-L-O-R-M-A-P-P-S. And his website is educationonfire.com where you can listen to the podcast. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for listening. Now check out our website, pursuitwellbeing.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And if you feel inspired, please rate and review it and share it with your friends. I love getting your feedback and learning how we can improve our program.